Well, good morning. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I welcome you to our service here today. This is Epiphany Sunday, uh, a day when we remember and celebrate the Magi, the wise men, the kings, making their way to find Jesus. Now, Epiphany is actually January the 6th. But we celebrate it the Sunday before, unless we want to have a special service on Thursday, which most, most of us probably don't do. So we will celebrate today. And this also being the first Sunday of the month, we will be celebrating Holy Communion as well. Um, just wanted to uh, thank everyone again for uh, the cards and gifts that we received during, during Christmas and are, are just uh, very thankful for this season. In fact, uh, Epiphany is one of my favorite seasons or parts of the Christmas season. Uh, it's sort of Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, kind of all part of the same celebration. And Epiphany uh, for me represents uh, several things. First of all, it means that we survived Christmas, uh, which is always good. Uh, Christmas is a busy time for all of us, but especially in the church. And uh, when we've reached Epiphany, that's, that's a good sign. Uh, but Epiphany also is a time, as we will be talking about when non-Jews, the, the Gentiles, the, the wise men who traveled far to find Jesus to hear the invitation to come and worship. Um, there's a lot of good Christmas hymns, aren't there? But one of my favorites is Angels from the Realms of Glory, because that refrain says, come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. And we come to worship. And so we hear this invitation. So as we talk about the visit of the wise men, and I ask if you want to follow along in, in your Bible, the scripture lesson for today is from Matthew chapter 2. Uh, the first 12 verses, a familiar story to most of us, the visit of the wise men. Hear these words again, Matthew chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out from there. And there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The word of God for the people of God. An invitation. An invitation to come and worship. It comes in many different forms. For the wise men, it came in the form of a star. A star that they had seen. A sign in the heavens. You see, they were astrologers, astronomers, watching for the heavens for a sign. A sign that a king had been born. And when they saw that sign in the heavens, they began their journey. You see, they wanted to find this king. They wanted to search. They, again, to them, that was a, a message, an invitation. Come, come and worship. And so they began their travels. They followed the star. 
But then for whatever reason, the star disappeared for a while. And so as they were traveling, they traveled to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel. And so they thought, well, if a king was going to be born, maybe that's where it would be. Or at least maybe they can tell us where to go. And so they traveled and traveled into Jerusalem. Now we're told that when they arrived in Jerusalem, it created quite a stir in Jerusalem. Now, one of the important things to look at in this scripture passage is we're not really told how many wise men there were, how many magi or astrologers that traveled there. We, we, we sing the hymn, We Three Kings. There were three gifts that were presented, the gold and frankincense and myrrh. And so we've maybe made an assumption that there must have been three of them. Each one brought a gift. Anyone going to a, a celebration would bring a gift. And there were three gifts, so maybe there were three. But many scholars think that there were probably many more than just three. Would three have created such a stir? It says that King Herod was, was terrified when they arrived. And all of Jerusalem with them. Would three have caused such a stir? Probably not. It may have been many more than that. Some think there may have been as many as a hundred or two or three hundred that had traveled. Many astrologers that had traveled and come to see this king that had been born. And so they traveled and they entered Jerusalem and asked, where? Where is this king that has been born? We, we saw his star while we were in the east. We've traveled a long way. Probably about a year that they had traveled. You see, travel was, was slow and difficult in those days. And so they had traveled a great distance and traveled a great deal of time. And, and they wanted to, to know that the star that they had seen had, had gone away. But where was this child to be born? And it was then that King Herod though he was scared at their appearance, called together the, the scribes and the chief priests and asked them, where? And I find it fascinating that they were able to quickly find where in the prophecies the king would be born. The prophet Micah had proclaimed years ago, several hundred years earlier, that the king would be born in Bethlehem of Judah. Bethlehem. So the wise men, they, they left Jerusalem. But I find it fascinating that when they left Jerusalem, those that were able to follow the prophecies, those that knew the scriptures, the scribes and the Pharisees, and now King Herod himself, why didn't they go with him? Why didn't they go with the wise men to Bethlehem to see this king that had been born? King of the Jews. Well, of course, Herod was... Well, he was mad. You see, he thought that he was king of the Jews. He had purchased this title, actually, because he wasn't a Jew himself, but he had, had become king of the Jews there in, in Jerusalem. And so he, he didn't like this about another king being born. In fact, he was very brutal. He, he didn't like competition at all. He had actually killed some of his own family because they did, he didn't want them to kill him so that they could take the crown from him as king. So Herod was a brutal person. In fact, before the wise man left, he said, when you find this, this new king, let me know so that I can go and worship him myself. But that's not what he meant, was it? He knew that if he found him, he would kill him. That Herod was that brutal. In fact, later on we find that he sent his soldiers down to kill infants in a large distance around Jerusalem and Bethlehem, hoping that he would somehow kill this child that had been born. Why didn't they follow the wise men to Bethlehem? Probably because there's actually a difference between knowledge and wisdom. To, to know something is to have knowledge. The, the scribes and the Pharisees, the, those who had studied the Old Testament scriptures, they had knowledge about where this king would be born. But wisdom, wisdom is knowing what to do with knowledge. 
Wisdom is knowing what to do with the knowledge that you've been given. And so we call them wise men, don't we? Because they took that knowledge that they were given about where this child would be born. This knowledge that they had obtained by watching the stars. And instead of just staying home and saying, oh, there's a new star. Must be a new king being born. They were wise. They had wisdom in that they followed then that information that they had obtained to find this new king. When they got to Jerusalem, they were given additional information, weren't they? Bethlehem. According to the prophecies, he will be born in Bethlehem of Judah. And so they took that knowledge and they set out again to find this king that had been born. They had this wisdom to know what to do with the knowledge that they were given. This invitation that God had given them to find Jesus to come and worship. And it says that when they began their travels again toward, toward Bethlehem, the star reappeared. God was guiding them again. And it came to rest over the place where the child was. And it says that they were overwhelmed with joy. Their journey was complete. Their, their quest to find the child, this new king that had been born, was completed now. It had taken them many days, months, possibly years, to find this child. And the star shone on the place where the child was. And they were filled with joy. And so they went in. They went into the house, it says. Not a stable, not laid in the manger now. The, the crowd had gone away. The census was over. Mary and Joseph had taken the baby into a house. And the wise men come in. And it says that they knelt down and paid him homage. They knelt down and worshipped him. They, they had heard the invitation, hadn't they? Come and worship and now they'd found him. And so they come in and they, they worship him. They praise God for this baby that had been born, this new king, king of kings and lord of lords that they had been seeking after. They persevered, didn't they? They didn't give up until they had found him. That's a lesson that we can learn as well about finding Jesus. Seeking our Savior, hearing the invitation ourselves to come and worship. And they presented gifts. The gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. We know that story well too, don't we? Gold. A gift worthy of a king. That he was born to be king. He was royal. He was a king. A different kind of king than most. Not an earthly king, but a spiritual, a heavenly king his, will be his kingdom. But they presented gold, recognizing him as a king. They presented frankincense. Frankincense is a sign of his divinity. Frankincense was, was burned as incense to, to show the prayers going up to God. Uh, again, acknowledging his divinity, that he was in fact God. But myrrh, symbolizing his humanity. You see, Jesus would die. He was human, just as you and I are human. He felt pain and suffering, just as you and I feel pain and suffering. So these gifts represent his royalty, his divinity, and his humanity. That Jesus was all of these things at once. In ways that we really aren't even capable of comprehending. How can he be truly God and truly human at the same time? But he was. But he was. And so the wise men come in and they see, they see God. They see God in the flesh. This incarnation that we have been told that, that God took on human form and came as a baby. They saw God. That's the epiphany. Epiphany means a manifestation of God, a, a, a revelation of God. And so they were able to see God in that child. 
they had heard the invitation. Come and worship. And they came and found this child king. They offered him gifts. They worshiped him. They saw God. This is the invitation to come and worship, to see God, the presence of God, of Jesus, even with us as we worship together. And then it says that they were warned in a dream to go back a different way, to not go back to King Herod. Herod had lied to them. And so God spoke to them, told them to go back a different way. They went back a different way, all right. They went back changed. They went back changed because of their encounter with God. You see, you can't encounter Jesus and not be changed. That grace that we receive by encountering Jesus is changed, will change us. That amazing grace that we sing about, it comes to change us, to transform us. You see, because as unforgiven, un unredeemed sinners, we can't be in the presence of God for eternity. It's only by receiving the grace that is offered that we can be changed into disciples of Jesus Christ, that we can be forgiven, cleansed of our sins so that we can be in the presence of God for eternity. And so we need to hear that invitation, don't we? We need to hear the invitation to come and worship. And what matters is how we respond to that invitation. Do we ignore the invitation? Do we just take that as knowledge and leave it there? Or are we wise enough to follow that invitation? You see, wise men and, and wise women still seek Jesus Christ, don't they? Yeah. Seek Him, and, and, and if we have the strength to persevere, the strength through, through God, the, the grace that we need to receive in order to find Jesus in our own lives. You see, accepting Jesus is a very personal thing. We, we, we can't accept Christ for someone else. We can only accept Christ for ourselves. And so I pray that you have heard the, the invitation, that you've received the knowledge about Jesus Christ, about a God who loved you enough to send His Son, to die on the cross, to take away your sins, but that you're wise enough to do something with that knowledge. To let that knowledge change who you are. You see, we each need that epiphany in our own lives. We each need to find Jesus Christ for ourselves. Nobody else can do that for us. Now we can share the message of Jesus Christ, can't we? We can invite others to come and worship to find Jesus Christ themselves. But we need to know, not just about Jesus, but we need to know Jesus in a very personal way, in a way that changes us as we accept that invitation to come and worship. We, in a way, we have an epiphany every time we worship God and receive Holy Communion. <laughs> You see, the elements that we receive are a, a, a tangible, visible sign of God's grace. It, it reminds us of Jesus Christ, particularly reminds us of His humanity, the, the bread representing His flesh, the, the juice representing His blood, that Jesus was truly human and that He died on the cross, that that was God incarnate, God loving us enough to send His Son to die on the cross for us. And so as we celebrate Holy Communion in a way that is an epiphany for us, a way of seeing and feeling the presence of God with us, the presence of Jesus Christ with us. And as I'm speaking, I see our door in the back opening. <laughs> the presence of Jesus coming in to be with us. God is already here with us, isn't he? I hope that wasn't him leaving. <laughs> God has his own way of doing things. But as we 
remember and celebrate the sacrifice. Let us remember the true humanity of Jesus Christ and the true divinity that He was truly God. And it's only because He was truly God and truly human that He is able to take our sins upon Himself. He was without sin, so He was able to take our sin that we might have the promise of eternal life. Come and worship. Hear the invitation to know Jesus Christ in a very personal way. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the invitation that you have made. We thank you for the invitation that you made to those wise men so many years ago that they heard that invitation to see the star in the sky and came until they found Jesus and worshiped him. That invitation is still made to us today to come and worship, to bring our gifts, to bring our lives to Jesus Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Pour out your grace upon us especially as we again remember the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross as we encounter Christ again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Each of you should have re in your pews the elements for Holy Communion. Um, I also have gluten-free elements if there's anyone that has issues with gluten. There should be enough distributed around. Does everyone have communion elements? As we remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he, he gathered with his disciples in the upper room. But we have to remember too that as we gather to receive, we need to recognize that we are unworthy. We don't come and receive Christ because we're worthy to receive Him. We receive Him because we're unworthy. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And on that same night at which He met with His disciples, He took bread from the table. He blessed it. He broke it. He passed it to His disciples and said, This is my body, broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. You may remove your mask and take the bread, the body of Christ, broken for you. And then he took a cup from the table, a cup of wine. And he said, this is my blood, blood of a new covenant. A new people, a new, a new invitation to come and worship Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we receive again the elements of bread and juice... We ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon them, that may, they may be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Lord, may, may we hear the invitation again to come and worship, to worship you as our King, as our Savior, as our Lord. But pour out your Holy Spirit and your grace upon us as we seek to serve you as our King. Show us those opportunities as well to invite others to share the good news of great joy for all people. Invite others to come and worship. To know you as their Lord and Savior. This we ask in Jesus' name. And amen. amen.